All right, welcome back, Aspire Leaders and Teach Better family. I'm so excited to have my yearly annual conversation with the great C.J. Reynolds, who was highlighted last week by Allison Apsey as he had written a wonderful contribution for her new book. But I just, I, I always say it's like Christmas around here when I get the chance to meet with this guy because he's not only a phenomenal educator, leader, speaker, author, YouTuber, but he's just the most amazing person. And I am honored to call him my friend. Love spending time with them. CJ, thank you so much for being on Inspire to Lead once again. Man, always, always thrilled to be on here. I love that this is a yearly conversation <laughs> now that is intentional time for us to catch up and for everyone to listen in on it. So, well, I we always joke that the pre conversation, post conversation is probably longer than the episode itself because, yeah. you know, I, I just love spending time with you. But I would love for you just to kind of update the audience because the last time and pretty much every time that we've talked, you have been in Philadelphia where you have been yeah. for the rest of your, you know, for all of your life. And you are in a new location, which was with some exciting news of uh, being out West and thank God closer to me. I, I am. <laughs> we now live in New Mexico of all places. And when I told my students I was leaving, especially kids I keep up with for years, yeah. they were like, well, I don't even know where that is. I'm like, no, one knows. <laughs> no one knows where New Mexico is. It is uh it is, and I like that. So I am in the process of becoming an urban cowboy. And, I, you know, that's my goal right now. So we moved from Philly in September, kind of on a whim. Mm -hmm. But it is, man, one of the best, like I was saying to you, one of the best decisions I ever made as an adult. It is, I, I love, my favorite question, I was just telling this to Josh, my favorite question from people is, this, they have this look of bewilderment. They're like, why did you move here? And so first I tell them I'm on the run from the law, but then I tell them that it's all the reasons they don't like it, right? There's stars here at night. We yeah. literally will stand in the backyard and we just look up. My kids did not know shooting stars were a real thing. We have three stars in Philadelphia. That's it. That's all you can see. <laughs> Moving here, it's the sound of coyotes. Yep. It's you never saw people get so excited for tumbleweeds ever in your life. We just think it is the most hilarious thing. And it was like, man, it's like, a, I feel like I'm in a Western. So yeah, we're in the process of all becoming urban. Well, I am. My children have want nothing to do with it, but it's they'll come around. I So anyone that follows CJ on his social media, I just love your stories. I love what you post. I saw the giant giant belt buckle that you were oh. sporting around yeah so you are well on your way sir of becoming the urban cowboy yep look no one likes it not one person <laughs> in my family uh especially when i know them, when we go places but i'm just trying to it's just you know it's kind of funny but it's also i just want to really be where i am and so yeah. it's there's philadelphia has been voted the rudest city in the country for many years in a row and it's just nice to be somewhere where, like I said, still love Philly, but there's just something about the slower pace. Yeah. There's something about the genuine kindness of strangers. And I just, man, so I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to wrap myself up and <laughs> soak it in, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome to the West. Yes. <laughs> so no, I, you know, we, we've been here now almost a year in Colorado and, and my kids have all experienced similar things to what you're saying as far as we saw tumbleweeds, we, we see the stars at night, uh, coyotes. I mean, we see deer literally in our yard every other day, uh, it, which is amazing and really fun for our little kids. But uh, definitely new experiences. And uh, I'm so glad that you have done that for yourself, for your family and are loving uh, the new transition. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm experiencing that firsthand myself. So I'm um, so happy for y'all. And then obviously, you know, for those who are watching on YouTube, you can see that you've got a brand new space that's much bigger than what we've seen in the past. Yes. Yeah. I was used to be in the laundry room and <laughs> that was tricky because try making a video when the dryer goes off, you know, or sure. like someone's hungry or whatever. So now I have a whole room to myself, which has been incredibly fun. And now we're planning on building a studio space uh, in another part of the house soon. But this was like, this was the, the first place that got organized. It was everyone had a bed and then dad has to get back to creating content. 
So this, I got my room together before anybody got there. <laughs> you don't need the dresser. You need the studio first. So that's yeah, perfect. Yeah. It was like, how are we paying for the dresser if dad's not working? So exactly. we got to get on it. All right. So you talked about content and I want to dive into that, CJ, because, yeah. you know, for most people, Real Rappers Reynolds is, is the name that's associated with you, your content on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So for those who maybe this is their first entry point to you and into the content that you create, will you just share not only what you are creating on YouTube, but then also, uh, you know, you have kind of a newer thing going on too, I think on Sundays where you're kind of tapping into a, a different type of engagement with educators. So I would love for you just to talk about both of those entities. So, you know, when we started making YouTube videos, it was because of my son who this we're going on eight years uh, this spring that will be yeah. on YouTube. And I started as a family channel and some of those videos are still up. My kids had me take once my daughter got into middle school, she was like, dad, you got to go back and take these down because if my friends find them <laughs> it's all over. So I went back, took some of that stuff down, but there's a considerable amount of stuff still up there of when this was not about teaching, but, like many other kids, my son lost interest quickly because it was a lot of work. And we thought, what could we make videos about? And the only thing I, the thing I know the most about that I've had some success with in my life was teaching. And so the question became, well, what do I wish existed when I started teaching? Because there's, there's so much, I mean, when I started teaching, there were a lot of blogs, there's a lot of books, but not, not from folks that I necessarily connected with. There were heroes I had in the space, but what they were doing was 25 and 30 years in, and it seemed so unattainable. So what could I put on the internet that would help someone tomorrow walk into the room and have a better experience than they did today? And so that's what we started creating. I mean, even to this day, I rarely, if ever, come up with a video concept on my own. I just look in our Facebook group, I look at what people are talking about online and take suggestions. And folks will say like, what do you do about this? How do I handle this? So we make YouTube content around that. And then the on Sundays we do. So for a long time, it was just me doing like live Q&A on we're in our we're just about to finish our seventh season. So we each so our seventh year doing this on Sunday, Sunday night teacher talk where is a live Q and a show, but for ages, cause I cannot multitask Josh. So my wife would sit off on the side and never say anything, but, and we referred to her as the not so secret wife that no one could see and this last year. I talked her into coming on and she did not want to cause the internet is mean. And even though we have really kind people, she's like, I can't take nasty comments. Like I'm just yeah. going to lose my mind, yeah. but she has jumped in and now we do it together. And that's really fun. And so we just take questions that are like every Sunday, it's a core of the same people. There's always new folks jumping in, but it's folks that are showing up to get help in real time so that you can go into school on Monday and you're giving help. So when you ask a question, there's tons of people in the comments that are going to respond back to you. So you're never just hearing from me. You're hearing from all kinds of folks from all different kinds of classrooms. Yeah. And then that's also converted into a podcast also, right? Yeah. yeah. It's uh teach better radio or teach better. Uh, sure. Teach, teach better radio. <laughs> All of us are some form of somebody else's. Right. right? But it's the teacher class off radio yeah. podcast that's on everywhere that podcasts are. And then it streams on YouTube and everywhere else that will allow me to stream on StreamYard. Well, now I just need to make a teach better radio since you've now there you go. that into my brain. Yeah. So. All right, so let's talk about what folks are talking about during this time of year, because I know a lot of teachers reach out to you either through that format or just straight up hitting you up on social media, on YouTube comments yeah. or uh, via email or through your uh, website. So what is kind of the main touch point or pain point for teachers right now? Because right now it's spring, <laughs> spring has yeah. sprung, people are ready for the summer. And I think you know, when we were talking before too, is survival seems to be kind of a key word. So curious on where the pain point is for teachers right now. So it is a lot around survival. I get a lot of questions on, you know, my daughter's last day of school is today. I know a yeah. lot of teachers out Our here student. 
are finished this week. Mm-hmm. But man, if you're in the Northeast, like Philly's not done until a month from now. About. Yeah. Yeah. New York too. And so there's, there's tons that can feel like an eternity for some other teachers. And I remember being in Philly and teaching, you'd see someone from, you know, some other part of the world that they're getting done. And you're just like, what, what are you, what are you guys, do you even teach? Like what's happening there? Like, what are you guys even doing? So the, my answer is kind of like, I get a lot of like survival tactics and I think there's stuff you can absolutely do. There's stuff I think you should stay away from also where yeah. like movies, bro, stop showing movies. And here's why, because every teacher showing a movie. So if you can figure out a schedule with your staff, then by all means do it. But I, and I understand how tiring it is at th- this point of the year, but if you can find something to do that is productive uh, and this is for those teachers that your school district has not figured it out and they have you babysitting because grades were already due, finals are already done, and we still have kids in our classroom for some reason. Yeah. First, So my first answer would be go talk to your district and see if we can realign the schedule because that is a nightmare yep. to deal with. And there's no accountability for kids, so but they just come to school and it's a madhouse. But when you're there, I think doing things that are just fun that are just building community, that are just connecting kids, that are just ending the year on a bang instead of the year ending in like a, like you're just fizzling out. That's, Mm -hmm. that just sucks. That's not how I want to start my year. It's not how I want to end my year. So in the classroom, for me, the answer was doing silly stuff. So maybe we do like silly STEM exercises. Maybe we would do games that, so I taught ninth grade games that my kids would have played when they were in like second and third grade. So like uh seven up or a race or tag or something like that. That's because they're now at the age where they, they're, they're, they can appreciate nostalgia. Right. So it's like, Oh, we used to play this when we were younger playing. If you're going to do Kahoot, like there's weird stuff on Kahoot. There's whole games based on SpongeBob and other nonsense that isn't necessarily educational, but Building community always benefits education. And some kids are not looking forward to the summer. So I love to be able to just give them all that I can in the remainder of the year so that they're having the best time they can. So this isn't just a throwaway to me. Go on trips, have people come in and speak to your class. Like there's things that you can do, have kids help you break down your classroom that are just fun minute to win it games are a favorite in our classroom. Any of the like ridiculous stuff that they sell at five below, like here, put this Velcro hat on and we're going to throw these Velcro balls at your head and see how many can stick like that stuff. It, it brings joy to the classroom. It brings joy to your students and it gives them something else to do, which is going to help you with classroom management at the end of the year, instead of just putting on the same movie that they watched 17 times already today. Yeah, I think that's when you get into trouble, right? Is if you don't have a plan or you're trying to fill time, but you don't know how to do so, or even like large transitions. I always used to talk about that with my teachers. You know, I would go in and not that I was there to like scold, like scold them for their teaching, but just kind of like look at where there might be some small improvements. And some of the times like, man, especially our young teachers, that they just didn't understand like how to transition one thing to another. And then you've got like, sometimes it's like five minutes of a teacher trying to find paperwork or find something to set up for the next activity. It's like, well, you're just asking for some kids to get bored. And when they get bored, they're going to be creative on how to fill that time. And I guarantee it's not going to be within the code of conduct that's established for the building. Right. You know, So what are some things that you're thinking of too, that maybe teachers can shore up to make sure that our, our students aren't <laughs> taking that time to get yeah. uh, a little creative? So I I would say this, instead of just surviving the rest of the year, this is such a great time of the year to experiment on stuff. So don't, don't, because I think what ends up happening is folks are holding on for dear life. It's like Jack Sparrow in the end of the first (laughs) part of the Caribbean movie, when he just makes it to the dock and he's on the top of the mast and steps off. That's what everyone's trying to get to. For sure. Instead... What are things you wish would happen next year? What are new policies, procedures, rhythms you'd like to build in? And especially for folks that still have a month left, 
use this time of the year to experiment because what's the worst thing that's going to happen? It doesn't go right. Then you're not locked into it for the rest of the year. But I think too many folks put off till August or September what they could try this year. And here's the problem with that. When we wait, you don't even know if it's going to work. So then you're going to go full tilt commitment in September on something new when you could try it now and go, oh my God, oh, yeah, I, I didn't think about these other aspects of that and how this might not work out. So trying stuff that you've saw, seen on the internet, that you've saved on Pinterest, that you heard from someone else, just giving it a shot and seeing, is this something that can work, especially when you know your students. So you don't have to do this in every single class either. You could do this in classes where you trust the kids, you know who you're dealing with, you know someone's not going to like lose their mind because you told them they can't go to the bathroom or they have to do like this is how you hand in work or whatever and let them know, hey, I'm, you know, this is my favorite time of the year. We're going to experiment with a bunch of stuff and you can get feedback from those kids and you know who you can trust with that feedback as well. So I, I think experimentation is the name of the game this time of the year. So let's let's talk about the fear that goes with that, because yeah. I <laughs> I know that this exists. I've seen it firsthand and I always tried to say yes as a as an administrator more than I said no, because I wanted people to try things, because if they didn't try it, we don't know if it's going to work, if it's going to stick, if it's going to be successful. But there were so many teachers that were really fearful of either loss of control or it not going well. And the perception of, oh, you're a terrible teacher, like some of the persona that goes along with that, too. So. What would you say to those folks that are just like have this huge cloud of fear over them in regards to experimentation? So the man, that's such a great question, because I think what that really speaks to, Josh, is not necessarily your pedagogy, but your person. Yeah. And in learning to try new things, you you release yourself from fear because not, and I'm not a therapist or anything like that, but I just know for that, what I've tried. When you get used to trying new stuff and failing, you realize that it's not that bad. That what's the worst thing that's going to happen? You're not going to catch on fire, right? Unless maybe you're no. using like a Bunsen burner. <laughs> maybe a science teacher. Yeah, yeah. You're, 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 just, you're just trying stuff. And when we get used to doing that and our students see that, that we're just trying stuff out and getting used to it, I think that they can understand it. And especially when kids know that what I'm trying to do here is make a better class for you. I am trying new stuff that I think is going to make for a better educational experience for you each day and for the people that come after you. So if you are afraid, I think it's, it's worth entering into. I mean, what, what is honestly, it's like, what's the worst thing that could possibly happen in, in this? So and that like really go there, right? Like there's this uh, practice called fear setting where you have to really think about what, what could go wrong here. Is a kid going to lose it? If they lose it, what's going to happen? Is someone going to get mad? Is someone going to tell their parent? Is the parent email? What's that going to be like? So you is admin going to come running in the room? Cause it sounds like a madhouse. But I think the other thing is, not being afraid of classes getting loud. I think that that's even more of a fear for teachers than someone like, no one's gonna like chuck some scissors across the room because you started something new or tried something new. It's just gonna get too loud. Then you bring it back and you help the kids understand and you have a conversation about it. But it's, I, that's where I go with the fear is that we need to grow into the individuals that our students need us to be. And that's someone that's willing to try. We are constantly trying to get our students out of this place of fear. Does anyone have a question? Would anyone like to share anything? Does anyone want to push back on that? Does anyone want to read? Who wants to go first? If we're not willing to be the example for every single thing we want our students to be, then I don't think we have a right to even ask our students to do those things that we're not willing to. And so put that fear out there and try it anyway. All right. I want to highlight two things that you said. So one being transparent with your children, with the students, right. Yeah. And saying, Hey, we're trying something new, <laughs> putting it out there. Yeah. If it grows great and you all love it, we'll do it again. We'll do it more. Right. Um, and, and being transparent with them about what's going on. Right. 
uh, I think that's very important because they see you as a real person trying new things to better them as an individual. But two, on the leadership side of things, I can I can think of plenty of times where I heard something loud, thinking the worst, going into the classroom and seeing the students were engaged, they were having fun, they were learning at the same time, and just my heart <laughs> literally singing inside my chest thinking of what an amazing opportunity that this teacher is providing our students. And that's what I want to see in every single classroom. And yeah. so hopefully if you're a leader, if you're someone that's a building principal, superintendent, you're going to classrooms that are loud. That's what we want. I want people out of their seats. I want people engaged. I want people to be excited yeah. to be in those educational spaces and going in and seeing rows of silent children doesn't mean that they're engaged. <laughs> no, usually means the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. And think about that. Right. Like in the 50s, this was the goal. Right. In the 60s, same thing. I mean, geez, there's still there's schools all over the place that all the time. Wait, quietness with there's something brilliant going on. Yep. And it is not the case. I was actually Josh was sitting in a class working with some teachers in New Mexico. And there was a young woman that sat in the back. She was from a local college and she was coming in and doing like a practicum. So she's doing sure. a series of observations. So we were just talking in the back and the classroom next to us, somebody screams and all the students look at the wall and she goes, Oh my gosh, I don't know. That's probably, that's like the worst class on in the whole hallway. And I said, why do you think that? And she goes, it's all, there's always something like that happening. I said, <laughs> it could also be the best class. Like how do you act on a roller coaster? How do you act when you're excited at a party? How do you act when you're at any number of things that are fun? Yeah. It's you look at joy is loud and we need to not be so like warn your neighbors if, you, if it's going to be super loud. And I've made I've made that mistake many times where people have run in my room. Yep. But it is joy is often very loud. It's coming. Learning how to come back from that is mm -hmm. the, is the key. But don't be afraid of loud classrooms it's i wear it as a badge of honor for sure i mean when the timberwolves are going to the western conference finals i can assure you that my neighbors were probably thinking the worst of my household because my four sons and myself were screaming at the top of our lungs jumping up and down yep. <laughs> so to get to your joy piece i think that's that's a perfect example and the perception that has been age old uh with schools and equating is that silence is better and i would push back just as much as cj and for those who are thinking, okay, I would love to do that. I don't know where to start. I will assure you that uh, there's a beautiful resource. Yeah. Teach a class off by the wonderful CJ Reynolds. I heard of that uh, book. Um, <laughs> you have a few of them. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've got to not only read this phenomenal book, but also have seen you speak on this. Mm -hmm. uh, you do a wonderful job. Um, it's, it's a phenomenal resource. But for those who are looking to maybe, you know, break the mold of what our typical traditional classrooms look like and need some assistance, will you just talk about this phenomenal resource? I, you know, just like the YouTube channel, I wrote a book that I wish existed when I started teaching. It is, I have never gotten teacher of the year. Uh, I've never done, you know, I, I don't have any accolades uh, except you know, what I wear as an accolade is, is students that I keep up with 20 years after they were in my classroom. Yep. But it's, it is filled with stuff that I wish I knew. So from mindsets, to lesson ideas, to things of that nature that are going to, that you can read and you will immediately walk into your classroom the next day and you can implement or start to implement, start to build, start to create and I hope it's a little bit of motivation and inspiration, too, for folks that are, you know, I th there's this real fear, Josh, and, and I see this constantly when I work in schools where there's a new teacher with all the ideas. They are just so excited, yep. but no one else is kind of doing that sort of thing. And it, they're fearful to be that, that person that's going to just turn it up. Man, kids don't have time to wait for you to do that. They need you to do it yesterday. Yep. And so create the culture in your school. You change the culture in your school. And that's, I mean, I've worked with some really incredible people, but that was always our push as a community was I cannot, I can't listen to the naysayers. I can't listen to the people that are complaining or yep. that hate the job or that just are here for summers off. We want to go on 11 every single day. And that's, 
I tried to create a book for teachers that were willing to take that leap of faith to go and, and pour into their students like that. Yeah. Well, I will say that you created something that is definitely a, a 11. So Thanks, uh, definitely check out the book. It's phenomenal. I'll teach your class off. And yeah, man, I, I love what you just said because I, I've experienced this myself. You know, you're doing something different. You are the outlier. And then you have a team of people either not understanding what you're doing and speaking negatively on it, or they're looking at you different, like, why, why are you doing it that way? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so I would just say for anyone that's doing that, if you're in the classroom or if you're a leader, embrace it, just do what you think is what is right. What is to your core that you know is going to create a better experience for your students. And even if it's different, even if it's something that not everyone's doing, it, you can still give yourself permission to continue on that pathway. Yeah. So let me ask you, what what was your thing when you were teaching or do, either teaching or doing administration that you felt like was pretty unique to you, right? Like, so what was like your, in your lane of giftedness as an educator? Well, I was out of my classroom all the time with my kids. <laughs> so like, I am one that I, and I did this in leadership too, but I, I would much rather do something that I know is right and ask forgiveness after it was successful than to ask for permission and get a no. So for instance, like mm -hmm. if, so if people go in my classroom and I was an art teacher, so I had a little more flexibility than, you know, maybe a core class, but I allowed my students um, to paint on my walls. Now, obviously there was like a structure within that. So like if, if you had ADHD, my classroom wasn't for you because you would never be able to focus on your project because there was so much going on. I had yeah. from the ceiling tiles and the 20 foot ceilings to all the way down to the floor, everything had color and, and was a form of artwork. In addition, I had like sculptures all over the campus. I never asked to do it. I just had installations that I would just have my students do. And sometimes they get destroyed by students and sometimes they wouldn't, but at least it was a conversation of like kids stopping and, and the, I'd have the artists like stand kind of in the vicinity so they could hear the comments and hear how it, the students would interact with the artwork. And so like finding ways to like go outside and like be in nature and create with the nature itself and yeah. know that it's not a sculpture that's going to last forever, but there is an art form that's, that is like that and showing the art history that goes with that. So mine was like more about experience, like experiencing the art and like also how it interacted with either nature or within the, the school itself. But then they also, I also had this, like, I don't want to be a typical art teacher. <laughs> like I want to have it where we're, you know, having conversations and sh you know, share with your partner and doing group work and, you know, having other artists come in, we did stop motion. So I'd have like these really long projects that were actually connected to businesses and what they would actually do in the, in the real world. Mm -hmm. um, so I was kind of pushing on all cylinders of like, I don't want to be your standard art teacher. I don't want this to be a standard class. I want it to be different than um, what anyone else experienced. And I'm not that everyone is going to be an artist, but I did feel like they could at least have an appreciation for art in a different light than what they've experienced prior. So I wanted to say push, 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 because you know what? I never got fired. I never got written up, <laughs> but I did challenge a lot of things and I did change some mindsets based on yep. the exper experimentation and the experience that I provided to my students. I love it. It's the, uh, it's the getting in the face of that fear. I've never, I never really gotten in trouble. I mean, actually, that's not true. <laughs> there are maybe a few times I got in trouble. I mean, I had some, I had some stern conversations with administrators, but yeah. in, in, in it, but I never got to the point where I knew how much to push, and I knew it was always going to be something that I had something to back in that experimentation. That's and you know what? Did kids have some crazy times, like with their behavior? Yeah, but like it wasn't anything that was. You know, a kid never got suspended. I never sent a kid to the front office in all of my six years in the classroom. Like there was always some sort of control. And they also yeah. knew like this was something that was different. They weren't going to experience anything like this in any other class. And if they were acting a fool, <laughs> then they didn't get to be in that environment that was going to yeah. be fun. And like you said, hopefully brought joy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, and it's it is learning from those mistakes sometimes a good idea in the moment, like starting a fire in the parking lot seems like a good idea. It's a learning <laughs> experience. And then you realize it was not. So right. you made a fire somewhere else in a more safe environment, but it, it's, you're right. And it is, 
I've just never gotten in that much trouble. And I'll tell you what, maybe, maybe this is a perk of the teacher shortage. I don't think anyone's getting rid of you. Like, no. I just think that it's uh, that there's too much going on in the world that's like they can't afford it. So it's and if what you're doing is for students, I think that that's huge. So I've never done anything. I, I find that the here's the big switch to Josh is that when I made lessons that I thought would be cool, when I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. Yep. But it wasn't connected to something I knew the kids were going to like. It's when I started going, how do how do I connect what you're interested in to what this is, what's happening right here? So if I was looking at um, persuasive essays or classroom debate mm -hmm. in this moment in time, or actually just kind of passed, but if you're not looking at the Kendrick Lamar versus Drake, like beef that, yeah. on, bro, you're mo you're losing. Even I don't care if you even like either of those artists. You know, I don't care if you agree with them. This is debate in real time that is happening that all of your students are paying attention to. Oh. So it's diving into that world and not being careful that I'm not trying to be cool. I'm just trying to be relevant. But if I can make it focused on kids, those are the projects and the lessons and the ideas that always did well. And even if it was, you know, starting a fire in the parking lot. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't know how to segue from that, but I want to talk about to you, uh, personally volunteering in schools in yeah. New Mexico. And I, I'm curious cause I, I want to know just what that experience is like now transitioning from the classroom to now what you're doing with, you know, your own company to now being a parent <laughs> going into someone else's setting and, and trying to, you know, help out as much as possible. But I want to know what you're learning from being a uh, volunteer now. So the funny thing is when we were living in Philly, I've always offered my services, even when I was still in the classroom. So now I'm full time, like running a business because yeah. I got tired of after seven years. I was like six years. I was like working two full time jobs. Like my hair was brown when I started this. And now it is, it is very, not. very much not. Yeah. <laughs> so I always offered my services to anyone in Philadelphia, like especially where my kids went to school to just say, hey, this is the work that I do. I get other schools pay me to do this. I'd love to just come in. I'm trying to just be a good neighbor. Nothing, man, nothing ever. We moved to New Mexico. I send every school within 30 miles of our house, the same offer. And mm -hmm. my, it, funny enough, my kids, both my kids go to two different schools and both of their principals were like, we would love if you came in to help there's just like some new teachers that could really use some help. And yep. the, I think as educators, people forget like how good you've got. So you, there's just something you do that you've learned through experience that you can teach someone else. So they don't have to take 10 years to get there, five years to get there, 20 years to get there. Yep. So, and that, I, lo I love that. It is like a gift that you show up that they didn't know that they needed. But when a te new teacher is starting class and no one's listening and you're like, here's four different ways that you can get everyone silent and on task. Here's how you get them through the warm up or through the pre-class that you're doing. And then here's how I'm noticing, like you said, there's zero ability to have kids transition from one activity to another. This is a thing that a lot of teachers talk about. I'm going to give you a handful of ways that are going to have kids transition so fast that you're going to have to be ready to jump right into the next thing. Cause I'm telling you, it's like from thing to thing right away. It's so fun because you see, you meet someone that either didn't know they had a problem or had no idea what to do about it. And you're just pouring fuel on that fire and then watching their classes transform and not always in some super big, like, way but being able to show up and do the work and not feel like you're completely dead at the end of the day is everything right i i want especially once i had kids i realized that i can no longer give other people's children more than i give my own so i have to figure out a way to leave school with something still in the tank so i can go home and still be a good dad and 
it's trying to help folks with that. So yeah, anyone in the uh, Eastern New Mexico area, I offer my services <laughs> for free because it's just part of being a good neighbor and, yeah. and helping out where I live. It's awesome, man. All right. So we've talked about YouTube, what you have there to offer. Yes. And then we've talked about your book, but I also want to talk about something that you are working with school districts on, which is workshops. Yes. So what, what are some topics that you're touching on and how are you helping school districts with these workshops? Man. So a couple of years ago, we started doing workshops that schools can pay for. They send their teachers to it's Most of it's online unless you want to bring us to your school, but it is, most of it is just not just, it is me creating online content that, you know, you make a YouTube video and you got to kind of follow the algorithm and play the game a little bit because otherwise YouTube doesn't push your stuff. So yeah. those videos are eight to 10 minutes and you can say a lot in an eight to 10 minute video, but if you really want to go deep into classroom management, student engagement, how to create transitions in your classroom, building relationships with kids, uh, you know, how to lesson plan, how to come back from a really like, all right, this went horribly wrong. I tried something and it didn't go well. How do I bounce back from that? How to, how to bounce back in February from right. a terrible first few months of school? I found that creating workshops that went deep, that they're only supposed to be 45 minutes, but they're usually like an hour and a half because I just can't even help myself. And then we have a live Q and A following them where folks can ask questions. So this isn't going to work in my school. How do I use this for fourth grade instead? You know, you're in ninth grade. How do I use this for math or physics or whatever? It is, dude, it's been so awesome because it's really helping folks out and making professional development actually matter. I can count. I have had three and a half, but really maybe two, maybe three professional development meetings in my 20 year career that mattered. The rest were nonsense. The rest were like someone checked off a box and said, all right, we did that. We covered IEPs, but they didn't really tell us how to deal with students that had learning differences that, so I can count on one hand, we're trying to create professional development that actually serves teachers, empowers teachers, inspires teachers so they can be the best version of themselves for their kids. So like this summer we're doing, here's one of my pet peeves in education. Because I'm at a school, the schools that I was at had such high turnover that most professional development was geared towards new teachers. Yes, It drove me nuts because I'm like, dude, I know like nothing, There's this is a good reminder, but what's the next kind of level of this? Yep. Like how, like let's bring in someone to talk about secondary trauma. Let's bring in someone that's gonna talk about some of these next level items Mm -hmm. We are creating two programs this summer. One is for, hey, it's your first year ever, for like first through three years. Yeah. Here's how you're going to get prepared for the year and feel like a boss when you're walking into the classroom instead of scared. And then something for folks that are like, let's say five to seven years and on. So you've you've heard all the preliminary stuff. You've done this for a while. It's still not clicking or you just want to level up what you're doing a little bit. So we're going to create something for those educators as well. And it's, dude, it's going to be awesome. Love it. Yeah. I mean, you can only do the blood borne pathogen PD. Yeah. You know, before you're, you're like, really, can I just like take the test and get it done with? Cause I, I don't want to see it for 45 around. minutes. That's, that's when we have to do the CPR one again. <laughs> right. um, and everyone wonders why does your CPR guy have uh, googly eyes? Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I don't know where those come from. <laughs> well, but that's the thing, right? We we expect this in the classroom for our teachers to differentiate and to have different tiers for our students. But then when yeah. we we provide to our staff, it's it's yeah. cookie cutter and it's you know typically on a, a lower level uh, due to staff uh, being new. So yeah, love this. So definitely check it out. I mean, for those who are watching on YouTube, obviously I've got you know CJ's website up constantly throughout our conversation. RealRapWithReynolds.com. Obviously, there's just like so many resources and links that you can tap into there. Um, I'm assuming, CJ, that they can find the workshops on your website. Yeah, right on the website. They'll be coming out uh, after Fourth of July weekend. And because, I mean, look, what we found is that when you're new, you want stuff in June. But yep. I just can't get it that I can't get it that fast. So that stuff will all be I, I can send you links to all the stuff as well that they can. Click Perfect. As well. 
Yeah. So for those who are watching or, or listening on that podcast platform, of course, you can find all this information on joshtamper.com. It'll be in the show notes or on your podcast player or in the description on YouTube. If you're you know watching on YouTube, definitely hit that subscribe and like button. Go over to CJ's channel too. Make sure you're doing the same. I can assure you that CJ's content is far better than what you're watching right now. He does a phenomenal job. He's been doing it, like he said, for eight years. Love everything you're doing, CJ. Now, you've done this plenty of times with me because, like I said, it's a yearly annual thing. But yeah. I always ask the same question to kind of bring us back to the reason why we started the podcast in the first place, right? We just hit our six-year mark, if you can believe that, CJ. Uh, yeah, Not as long as you, but I'm, I'm trying to get as close yeah, as possible. Catch up. You know, <laughs> trying, trying desperately. But um, yeah, the question is, you know, for the, those aspiring and current leaders that are listening, if they can do something tomorrow or next week to enhance their leadership journey, what would you uh, recommend? I think, you know, my answer has really shifted in the last year or so. I, you, you can't measure yourself against what other people are doing. And I think we do that too often. You really have to look at your own giftedness. What is this special thing that you have been given to share with the world and with your students? And that might not look like anybody else's stuff. It might even yeah. be weird. It might seem silly. It might be like folks look at you a little funny. It is yours to do any, you, you are, you've been given a gift that you're not sharing and that's, that's no good. But mm -hmm. who do you need to become to do that work? That's the big piece I think that has shifted for me is that confidence doesn't just show up, that you have to work for that. So what is the internal work you need to be able to to do so you can become the person on the outside for your students, the person that you were called to be. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think that that's, that's a huge part of the equation that we do not talk about often enough in education. Can I add to that CJ? Please. I don't typically do this, but because you know, <laughs> I feel no, comfortable with you. <laughs> this is a Stamper podcast, you know? No, I, I love what you just said, but I also want people to like guard it. Because yeah. I think in leadership, it's it almost like beats it, like the, just the chaos of the job beats it out of you sometimes, or you lose focus because you're putting out fires left and right. And I just want you to like hold on to it. It's, it's something that's dear and that's going to give you longevity in the job yeah. because it's something that you're passionate about and that you love. And so just guard it to make sure that it's something that you have as a touch point once a week, at least like a minimum, because I found myself when I was the most burnt out or not loving the job is because the things that I did at one point hold on dear or felt very passionate about, I lost focus on that because I was just so reactive to the job that I didn't really guard what was important to me in the first place. Yeah. Look, and that is, and there's times when you really can do that, but I would say for some of you out there, there are moments when you lose someone, you lose a loved one, or you lose a pet, or there's some kind of trauma that's going on in your life. And it's not doubling down on your work at school is not going to help with that. It is, you know, self-care is really, I think, self-development. So it's taking care of yourself on such a deep level yep. that you bounce back. It's not that bad things don't happen at school. What happens if you get really good at this job is that you're just better at dealing with things. So yeah. when a kid tells you off in class, it doesn't ruin your whole weekend. You have, you get to a place where you feel a sense of empathy for that student that you look forward to Monday to connect with them again and work through it with them that you're w reaching out to parents, not to tell them that so-and-so told me off today, but you know, I noticed this behavior and I really am wondering how we can work through this together, but you become the person that can deal with that. And then yes, guard it at all costs, no matter what anyone says, no matter how they look at you, it is what the kids, it, it's watch the kids. And when they light up because you're putting googly eyes on every single thing in the building or you're blowing bubbles in the hallway or you're singing songs or you learn how to play a recorder, like you're in third grade again, cause you got it at five below, not saying I did that, but <laughs> it is doing all, the things that you have been given to do, the things that you come up with, that's what makes school better. Otherwise, school is so horribly boring, man, yep. that we need teachers. Kids need teachers to show up being that version of themselves and at all costs. Love it. Man, CJ, I know I could talk to you for many, many hours, and typically I try to, but 
for our conversation, I'm going to close with this. How can people connect with you on social media? Obviously, we already talked about your website, and I would highly recommend everyone that's listening head over to realrapwithreynolds.com. Um, I'm going to put it on the screen, but how else can, can they connect with you? You know, the fun thing is uh, when you've been on the internet for so long, people can just Google you. <laughs> You're either going to find me or Ryan, and uh, I get called Ryan a lot, you know, but uh, you, so if you just Google CJ Reynolds, you can go to our website, you can go to the YouTube channel and social, all that stuff is the best way to kind of find what we're doing. Just find your inner Deadpool. That's perfect. That's, that's it. I get so many emails where folks are like, dear Ryan. And I'm like, Dad, <laughs> we tell everyone that's my cousin. I'm just like, that's my, bless, that's my not so handsome cousin. Uh, so I don't know what you guys are doing. <laughs> But you you can understand why people you know mix it oh, up yeah. seriously. Yeah, for I'll sure though. <laughs> so, like I said, head over to joshnapper.com. Uh, in the show notes, you can connect. I'll have all of CJ's uh, information there. And uh, please connect with CJ in any way possible. I know you know I say this a lot about my guests, but I, I really don't have guests on here because they are on an island. They are there to support you. Um, that's that's really why um, I have phenomenal people on Aspire to Leaders because I want you as a listener to connect any way possible, um, either finding a free resource or being able just to shoot an email off and, and ask a question that's really dear to your heart. And CJ is one that is very accessible. Um, and I always feel like as me personally, when I'm t talking with CJ, that I am a better person after the conversation, um, both because I'm getting wisdom, but also because CJ is just like, has this light um, and you can see it in the interview. And, and that's why CJ Reynolds, my man, you are one of the top listened to episodes on Aspire to Lead um, in the six year run. And I think that's because of how authentic and genuine you are in these conversations. And I'm just so proud to have you on as an annual guest on Aspire to Lead. Thanks, man. I always love doing this. I appreciate you having me.